All right, welcome back to ReprogrammingMind.com. Today we get to hear a highlight from Dr. Joe Dispenza on how to overcome your body, time, and space to change your future. So then to change then, it would make sense then that you'd have to be greater than your environment. You can't respond in the same way because if you do, you default back to the old person. Yes or no? So the change is to hold a vision in spite of environmental conditions, in spite of that state and not fall from grace. And if the body's been conditioned to be the mind emotionally and it's been habituated into a future, then it means the change is you have to overcome your body. And when the body gets aroused when it wants to get up and do something and you settle it down, that's the process of change right there. That's the overcoming process. That's, that's what it takes to arrive at your future. So if the body has a drives and it's emotional and it's habituated and you keep settling it down, I promise you, you're, tam you're taming your pet. You, you stay, you, sh you stay right there. I'm gonna feed you. I know you think you're gonna die. I know you're super busy. I know you get migraines. I know you have food allergies. I know it's better for you to lay down. I know, I know it's your mother's fault. Oh, no, 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 it's your ex's fault. You know, I know all that. You, you hang in there past all of those points. The body is trying to, trying to unseat you. It's, it's doing what it can and, and by, by causing it to fall back into the present moment, into the unknown, is how we overcome time. Because if you're not in the predictable future and you're not in the familiar past, those are the knowns, the present moment is the unknown. And that's where possibility exists, teaching people how to get there and stay there is a habit. You can get better at it the more you do it. It makes sense then that if you are truly going to really put all of your attention on you, to be aware of nothing but you, you would have to control all those thoughts that are connected to your body, to the people in your life, to the things you own, to the places you need to be, the place you live, the place you sleep, you know, your schedule, the past. We discovered that if we uh, ask people to close their eyes and now they're getting less sensory information to their brain. And we asked them to begin to take all of their attention off their body and go from a somebody to a nobody to take all of their attention off all the people in their life and to go from a someone to a no one. That means you lay down the character. No attention on the objects and things in your life. You go from <laughs> something to nothing. To take all of your attention off all the places you have to go and go from somewhere to nowhere and from some time to no time, you no longer are the character that you think you are in this three-dimensional reality, your consciousness. Now imagine this, so let's make it really simple. Your senses plug you into reality. If I took away your sight, your hearing, your smell, your taste, feeling with your body, would you agree with me that you would have no experience of three-dimensional reality? Yes or no? But what would you be if you were still you? You would be aware, yes or no? Aware of what? Nothing but you. And that is the perfect place where people begin to make really powerful changes. And we call that overcoming the self. Throw in the hormones of stress. And the stress hormones heighten our senses now and cause us to narrow our focus on the cause of the problem. And as the, as the arousal of those chemicals cause the body and the brain to become alert, we focus primarily on the material world. And if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you're living in this state of survival and state of stress, if T-Rex is chasing you, it would make sense you would be looking in your environment where to go. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. If you felt him breathing down the back of your neck, you would be thinking about your body, would you not? And if you were thinking about getting from here to the cave, you'd be thinking about how much time it's gonna take you to get there. So stress hormones cause us to put all of our attention on our bodies, all of our attention on our environment, all of our attention on time. It's kind of funny because to, if to change means to be greater than your body, to be greater than your environment and be greater than time, when we're under stress and we're in survival, it's really hard to change. 
In fact, it's not a time to change. It's a time to run, fight, and hide. And people spend up to 70% of their waking day living aroused by those stress hormones. So aroused that they become addicted to the rush of those chemicals and they use the problems and the people in their life to reaffirm their addiction to that emotion. And they're becoming addicted to the life they don't even like. And those chemicals are powerful chemicals that change the brain and body dramatically. We move out of homeostasis, we move out of balance, the body's mobilizing all of its resources for whatever danger it's perceiving in, in the outer world. The problem is, is that you have one or two of those experiences and then you start expecting them to happen. When you're under stress, you're always preparing yourself for the worst case scenario in your mind. Pre prepare yourself for the worst. Anything less happens, you have a better chance of surviving. So people that all of a sudden start imagining the worst things that could happen to them in their life and they embrace the emotion that's associated with it and it's the thought and the feeling, it's the image, the emotion, it's the stimulus and response, and they're conditioning their body to become the mind of anxiety. And you keep doing it over and over again, the body will have a panic attack without you. Try as you may to control it with your conscious mind. You programmed it subconsciously. And, and no planet that's 92 million miles away from here is controlling, causing you to be that way. I can tell you that. It's not cucumbers and it's not gluten either that's doing that to you. You're doing that to you. And so in living in stress and living in survival, the stress response is created when we can't control something, when we can't predict something, when we have the perception that something's going to get worse. And all of a sudden the arousal causes us to do what? Try to control, try to predict try to make everything right. And so when the, in the aroused state, the brain is in very, very high frequency. And it's shifting its attention from one person to another person, to another object, to another thing, to another place. And every one of those different elements has a neurological network in the brain and like a lightning storm in the brain. The brain starts firing out of order, it starts firing really disintegrated, it's firing incoherently. And when waves are interfering incoherently, they lose energy. We lose energy in the brain. And when we're under the gun of those chemicals, we narrow our focus, we over-focus, we obsess about something and you have 10 really great things that happen in your life and one doesn't work and you'll obsess about that one thing. In the state of readiness, in the state of survival, the brain is always trying to predict the next moment based on the past. There's no room for the unknown for a person in their life. And everything now, they have to see it, they have to smell it, they have to taste it, they have to feel it. Their senses are defining reality. And they're narrowing and narrowing their focus. And we just discovered that if we taught people to take their attention off of everything that's material, everything that's known in their life, and go from this kind of what we call a, a convergent focus or a narrow focus to broaden their focus and open their awareness to nothing. Now, I don't know how to explain nothing to a materialist, but there's nothing there. It's, and, and how big is emptiness or nothing? I don't know. But, but it's if, when people begin to broaden their focus and begin to sense space, the act of sensing, the act of feeling causes them to stop analyzing and thinking. And if they stop analyzing and stop thinking, they no longer activate those circuits in their brain that keep them in that state. And the brain starts to unify, it starts to synchronize, it starts to fire more coherently, it starts to organize in really healthy patterns and what sinks in the brain actually links in the brain. And so when we have people open their awareness to space and they pay more attention to it and less attention to them. They stay more aware of it and less aware of them. That they can lose their sense of identity, their sense of se self to nothing. Their brain waves beautifully change in really, really wonderful ways and the whole entire brain is now a symphony. And some people can get so good at this that they could actually let their body move into a light sleep. 
and it's resting in a light sleep while they're awake and conscious. And the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is wide open to information. But now they're sitting there with their eyes closed. They're not getting any information from the environment. They're in a meditation. There's only one other place information comes from, and that's frequency. And all frequency carries information. And when their nervous system is oscillating in order, it begins to become entrained to that unified field, that quantum field, that invisible field of unifying energy that exists beyond your senses. There's no people there. There's no objects. There's no bodies there. There's no things. I looked it up. What existed before the Big Bang? Nothing. And that place where that emptiness is, it's rich in frequency. And now something amazing happens. When a person's dialed down the neocortex, the memory bank of the known self, but plugs them into three-dimensional reality and their brain waves are in the very resonant state of theta, and they're in a hypnotic state, and the information is not coming through their senses from their environment, and they start tuning in, there's a connection that takes place. And all of a sudden, the nervous system starts interacting with energy and frequency, and the brain goes into these heightened, 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 heightened states of gamma brainwave patterns, and the brain is aroused. And the arousal is not pain. And the arousal is not fear. And the arousal is not anger or aggression. The arousal is ecstasy. The arousal is connection. It is the most familiar, unfamiliar feeling we'll ever have in our life. And that moment when that occurs and that autonomic nervous system is in high gamma, hundreds of standard deviations outside of normal, three standard deviation outside of normal is 2% of the population. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of standard deviations in gamma, coherent gamma, perfect coherent gamma. And those waves, as they interfere, start building bigger waves. And the brain starts moving into standing waves of energy. And that person now is getting a biological upgrade. And energy is informing matter. And there's the eczema. Now it's gone. There's the blindness. Now it's gone. There's the deafness. Now it's gone. There's the stage four cancer metastasized to the bones. It's gone. There's the Parkinson's. Now it's gone. Somehow there's a biological upgrade that takes place in the body. And literally they're interacting with that invisible field of energy. And we've just started to discover the different signposts, the different places, the resting points that the heart and the brain have to go to, to reach that elegant moment um, uh, where we have that experience. Imagine having that moment and realizing it's not coming from any person, any object, anything. It's not coming from anything outside of you. Imagine that, that, that feeling of what people call pure love. I don't know. There's no word for it. Connection, bliss, whatever that is, wholeness, oneness. Imagine when a person realizes that it's not coming from anyone outside of them. They stop looking for it everywhere else. And that's when the love affair begins. And it gets really hard to miss a date. We take the blood. We take the blood of those people who hit that point. There's information in their blood that causes cancer cells to reduce in metabolic function by 70%. We take that blood. There's information in that blood. We subject it to Alzheimer's genes. It downregulates the genes for Alzheimer's. I know this is politically incorrect. We take the plasma of those people and we put a really nasty virus. <laughs> we put that in the presence of the plasma of the people that run into that frequency and the virus cannot enter the cell. It cannot enter. We isolated the protein in the plasma of advanced meditators who have this moment that actually will inhibit the spike protein from entering the cell. Imagine that producing a pharmacy of chemicals in your body that work better than any drug. A drug study, by the way, is about 25% causality. 25% cause and effect, one out of four. That's usually a study that lasts 
six months, three months. The data that we study when we look at the blood of advanced meditators, 85 to 75% effective, that's three out of four. And they're signaling the same genes and they're making the same proteins. And that information is not coming from the diet. It's not coming from the drug. And I keep asking the scientists, where is that information coming from? Where are those chemicals coming from? Where is that information coming from in the blood that wasn't there at the beginning of seven days? Your nervous system <laughs> is the greatest pharmacist there ever was. And I can say that with such confidence now because I've seen the data. Now we're perceiving less than 1% of reality where we're witnessing a very small bandwidth of an electromagnetic spectrum that is the rainbow. And those different shades are bouncing off physical objects and giving us the illusion of separation, like a virtual reality experience. You're the character that, in the virtual reality experience. And we live in this reality and because we have our senses and we, we're, we're local in space and time, we're conscious that I'm this person separate from everybody else. And I have an identity. And the way you create in three-dimensional reality, of course, is you gotta do something. And you got to go do something and it takes time to get that thing done. So you have a thought like, I want a new, a new house. And then your brain actually will calculate how long it's going to take you to pay off that house. And so the person has the thought of this new vision of what they want in their life. And then they have to move their body back and forth all the time to ultimately get that, that experience. And it takes time and energy. And so everything in three-dimensional reality that we create takes a lot of time and takes a lot of energy. We all came from oneness. We came from source. We came from singularity. We came from pure love. What do you want to call it? Pure consciousness where there's no separation. Uh, the consciousness of everybody, of everyone, of everything, of everywhere, of every time. All the information that exists past, present, and future in that source. You're hanging out in source forever. You start thinking eternity. Is there anything else but oneness? What if there were many instead of one? And that's what created a separation from source. And we descended all the way down into density. When we come down to this level, we have so much separation that we have the free will to create reality exactly the way we want. We took a piece of the divine with us. And we become so immersed in this less than 1% of reality, because where you place your attention is where you place your... So how much of your waking day do you put your attention on energy and frequency? And how much of your waking day do you put your attention on matter and memories from the past and predictions of the future? The thing with the quantum field though, is that if you're unaware of it, it doesn't exist for you. If all of your attention is on the material world, it doesn't exist for you, it's there but you're disconnected from it. You have no connection to it because you're unaware of it. Just like your nose. Your nose has always been there. The moment I ask you to become aware of it, it exists for you. The quantum field is the same way. It's this invisible field of energy that is the full spectrum of all frequencies. And as you get closer and closer to greater frequencies, there's greater levels of experience that, that we get to have that has nothing to do with this three-dimensional reality. So in this three-dimensional reality is called space-time. And it's called space-time because it's got an infinite amount of space. I looked it up. Space is actually accelerating now. It's not just expanding. But if you truly want to pass through the eye of the needle and enter that realm called the quantum field, you can't take your body. You can't take, you can't take the character. You got to pass through the eye of the needle into that realm called time-space, that quantum is pure consciousness. You got to, you got to, leave the identity, the character behind. And the moment the person becomes nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. And they can linger in that vacuum, in that emptiness without a name, without a face, without a profession, without a past, without a disease. They can just hang out as pure consciousness. It is very fertile ground. Brain and the heart get highly organized. And all of a sudden the rules change because in the realm of time space, the quantum, there's an infinite amount of time. Now, I know that's hard to imagine, but think about it like this. How many things could you get done if you had all the time in the world? I'm curious. How many? If you had all the time in the world, you could, how many things could you get done? 
An infinite number of things equal to your imagination, yes? That's the quantum, but there's no objects, there's nothing physical. It's energy, it's frequency, it's vibration. It's information, it's consciousness, it's thought. And every thought in that realm has a frequency. So then when people begin to lay down the character in the virtual reality experience and become pure consciousness, they have to reframe their thinking once they enter that vacuum and it takes practice to realize you're not your body. You think when you're there, there's you and then there's not you. That's not even correct. There's, there's no separation. And continuously surrendering some aspect of your limited self to join your greater self, to lose your sense of self to nothing, to dissolve into that infinite sea of blackness and become more of it and less of us. When we do that properly, we run into something really, really big, information. But the information, as I said, is not coming from this very small percentage of reality. It's coming from the frequency that your nervous system is processing. There's a latent gland in the brain called the pineal gland that's a transducer. And a transducer is like a radio receiver. And every time we look at the scans of people who are connected, that part of the brain is on fire in their brain. That radio receiver is switched on and it's transducing frequency into very profound imagery in their brain, just like a TV antenna. And there's, a, there's an upgrade that takes place in melatonin. The mystical chemicals, this is, melatonin is a function of light and uh, lightness and darkness. Serotonin and melatonin are a circadian pattern that takes place brain chemistry-wise where? Here, in three-dimensional reality. When there's light, we make serotonin. When there's darkness, there's melatonin. But now the person's connecting to information and it's not coming from their environment. It's a frequency that's faster than the speed of light. It's quantum, things are connected there. And when that person experiences that, that frequency, that connection, the pineal gland begins to manufacture chemicals that are derivatives of melatonin. Melatonin can't be melatonin any longer. It's, it's interacting with a frequency that's different than light. And now melatonin makes really powerful antioxidants, anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-microbial, anti-inflammatory. Melatonin already causes you to relax. Now you are gonna chill way out. It's gonna turn into a benzodiazepine. You're gonna make Valium, natural Valium in your brain. And Valium does what? Shuts the lights out in the amygdala. What's that? The survival center. No fear, no anxiety, no pain, no aggression, no anger, no frustration. Take, take that molecule and tweak it again. Melatonin already helps you to sleep. Ooh, now you're gonna hibernate. First center, Sexuality, second center, appetite, third center, preoccupation with the environment. The body goes into stasis. The body metabolically changes. We're discovering this. Take that molecule, tweak it again. You create the same chemical found in electric eels. And what do electric eels do? They amplify energy in their nervous system. And these high amounts of energy in the nervous system are very highly correlated with what we think of those chemicals are. Take the molecule, tweak it again. Melatonin already causes you to dream, but this isn't a dream. All of a sudden you make the most powerful hallucinogenic known to man and all these five derivatives fit into the same receptor sites as serotonin and melatonin, but the brain is cranking with different information and the person's having a full-on sensory experience without their senses. They are having, what is happening in that moment is more real than the trauma that they had. 30 years ago, an experience enriches the brain. And the end product of an experience is an emotion, but this time the emotion isn't chemical. It's electric. It's an awakening. It's an arousal. It's a brainstorm. It's a moment of contact. It's a union. That arousal causes the person to wake up in that dream, wake up in that reality, and there are an infinite number of those realities. No different than looking in a dressing room, a through two mirrors and you see an infinite number, there's infinite number of realities. And it's so important for us to realize that we're not linear beings living a linear life. We're dimensional beings living a dimensional life. And it just takes practice to activate that little gland in the back of your brain. And we work really hard on demystifying. It has little crystals in it that when compressed, they begin to create a polarity in the crystals that create an electromagnetic field. 
we, we, there's the same passion that people have to be successful, to be an artist, to be an athlete, to be a musician, to be a business person, the same passion that they have in their life to achieve what they want. I want them to do that for themselves, turn it in and have that be something that they really want to experience. And we've just been so lucky to capture brains in that moment. And, and people, uh, they, they, you, I, can't, I can't make the stories up. It's just impossible. The person is having a profound change and when they come back to their senses, it becomes them and they become it in this, some bizarre way. And their spectrum of reality begins to broaden. They start to see what always existed but they just didn't have the circuitry to perceive it until they had the upgrade, not from inside the virtual reality headset. <laughs> they took the headset off. They got the upgrade from the information from the field. 